Hi everyone, my name is Yannick and I work for the uh, AI department in Montpellier as an IoT expert. It is my pleasure to be here and to share the teamwork on MLOps. This presentation is really going to be on sharing you our journey into MLOps, everything we've learned so far regarding the concepts, the tools, and how this is going to change the way we structure an AI project through ML principles. So we will start defining what is MLOps. Then we'll talk about the architecture and the different tools we use for this entire, with, with this entire project. In the first section, we will see how we handle the drift by monitoring both data and models. Fourth, we'll talk about automation, which is essential to DevOps practices with CI/CD. And finally, we will dive into continual experimentation and learning, which is really the fun part of MLOps. So what is MLOps? Before answering that question, I would like to mention how we got there. Initially, when we started this project, the whole idea was to add an AI layer on top of the Fire IoT platform. Many companies begin, begin their transition in the IoT with a proof of concept. But as soon as device measurements are displayed on the, on the dashboard, they do not know what to do next or find a way to get the most of their data. So we wanted to implement a solution that, that would help these companies exploit their data better. By browsing the web, we figured out that MLOps is all the rage right now. It is not research. It is already in use in a lot of production environments. The very first thing you should be aware is that 90% of ML models never make it to production, and this is massive. There are several reasons why AI models fails to make it to, put to production, but I would like to highlight the three main ones, to my opinion, of course. The first one is that too often, business is simply disconnected from the ML world. Secondly, it takes sometimes weeks or months for a data science team to deliver a candidate ML model for production. The third one is that the ML model performs well in the lab, but degrades fast in production. MLOps is the idea to bring DevOps principles into machine learning with the same goal, remove the friction between dev, but in this case, we are talking about data scientists and ops. There are some differences between DevOps and MLOps. In DevOps, versioning is only for the code. In MLOps, you version the code, data, model, feature with the core principle that you cannot improve something that you don't measure. In DevOps, continuous de deployment is about deploying a service. In MLOps, continuous deployment is about deploying multiple pipelines. In DevOps, you monitor throughput, latency, CPUs, and in MLOps, you monitor instead accuracy, model, and data drift. Finally, DevOps is continuous integration and continuous deployment, whereas MLOps is continuous integration, continuous deployment, and continuous training. The three ways. The three ways is the fu fundamental concept behind DevOps, and this is the key to make your business win. The first way is about quickly putting the code into a production environment or something similar. The goal here is to set the production performance as the only valuable reference for comparison because this is what the customer is going to see. The second way is about using automation via CI, CD to get a quick feedback from ops. The Spotify CEO calls that fail fast. So if something goes wrong in production, you fix it ASAP, but you learn from it in order to improve the feature. The third way is about experimentation and what you will learn from those, those experimentations. If we take the example of Netflix, they invented something called the Chaos Monkeys. To, ch to check how, this, how the system will adapt to changes, they occasionally turn off machines or alter data in the traffic to see how the system handles it. Working like this gives you a better idea on how robust your system is. Now, let's see what can happen when you do not adopt the three ways. The, this, the, 
the data science team work on its own and keeps the exper experimentation in its, in, in its lab. The real risk here is that you only have one model, one candidate, when the customer start using the solution. If the model performs poorly, you are stuck and it will take more time and more depth to find a solution because there's no feedback loop, no visibility on the production performance and no alternative in case of failure. Now, let's start from scratch with the same team, but this time around, we are going to use the freeways. In this example, it is important to know that everything we do is based on the production performance. Here, we are talking about the user experience, what the user is going to get on the screen. It doesn't matter if a data scientist had 95% of accuracy while doing his test, if the end user gets 70%. Here you can see we are cycling fast, there's continuous feedback, and this is what the DevOps call less trying, more deploying. By doing so, we shorten the time to value. Now it's time to talk about the tools we use with, the, with this internal project. As for DevOps, there are many tools you can use with MLOps, but we chose three to achieve our goal, and let's review them one by one. Fireware. So Fireware is an IoT platform which aggregates and contextualizes data from different sources, API, file, sensors. Kubeflow is an MLOps platform that runs on top of Kubernetes on which you create an ML workflow. It is simple, scalable, and battle-tested. Selon Core is an open source framework that helps you convert an AI model into a microservice that will be accessible via REST or gRPC comments, and they call that a model server. This is the architecture we use for the project. On one hand, we have the Fireware platform and the Fireware modules required to set up the full data flow. It starts with the IoT agent, which gathers data sent from the devices. Data is then transferred to the Orient Context Broker, which is going to persist the last known state of an entity into a MongoDB database. Historical data is going to be persisted into a CrateDB database by the Quantum Leap module, which is notified by Orion as soon as data comes. On the other hand, we have the Google Cloud Platform on which we run a Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cluster. This is where we have installed Kubeflow pipelines. Every time we execute an ML pipeline, it runs on Kubeflow. And to make things clear, each step or component inside a pipeline is a Docker container, and data is passed between, between those containers as a bucket thanks to the MinIO native object storage on Kubernetes. Before diving any, deep, any deeper with MLOps, let's get a better understanding on how Fireware works. What you can see here is the smart parking data model that we use for the city of Montpellier. The NGSI LD format used by Fireware is nothing but JSON with an ID and couple of attributes. What is great about Fireware is that it's really plug and play. You do not have to be a database expert to set up tables or collection as everything is done automatically. All you have to do is simply specifying a data model for following the Fireware guidelines and let Fireware do the rest, such as creating databases, efficient indexing, creating documents, etc. Then you can, you can quickly query all these data via REST APIs. It's that simple. With Fireware, everybody is able to create a full IoT platform without, I mean, without any effort, especially using Docker. Creating an AI service on top of Fiverr is as simple as putting some logic into the, into the data model by adding attributes de dedicated to your machine learning process. On the left, we have an observation entity for which we've have, we have added some attributes such as active AI model, accuracy, active model driftron, has model drifted, etc. On the right, we have the prediction entity. It was important to have two different entities, especially when you have to display both on a graph, whether it's BI or a database platform. This is the very first ML pipeline we created on Kubeflow. 
as you can see, we have an AI service that is going to use the fiber attributes in order to determine which path to take. If the smart parking has no live model running, in that case, we will execute the ML pipeline on Kubeflow. If that smart parking has already a model running, there is, then there is no need to retrain the model every time to save resources and make a prediction straight instead. Let's take a look on how Kubeflow works on Kubernetes. You can see here that Kubeflow is more than just creating workflows with an SDK. It is a complete MLOps platform on which the entire data science team can share their runs and experiments. You can see here that I'm specifying the fiber attributes, so no active model for that smart parking. And we are going to see the whole training pipeline in action. And it's done. Now I'm going to clone that pipe, uh, that run. And then this time around, I'm going to say that there's already a model running for that smart parking. So as I said before, no need to retrain the whole mo model. So just make a prediction instead. And this is it. As we kept moving forward on this project, we came to realize that it was a nonsense to persist the train model into MongoDB and to pull it every time we needed to make a prediction. This is why we owe for on Core to create a microservice for every model we create and that we can reach by REST comments. So that means that there is no longer a prediction component inside the ML pipeline, but instead a build and a serve component to create the model server. This model server will run on Kubernetes, but it's not associated with Kubeflow. Let's see how we convert a model into a, micro, into a microservice thanks to Celon Core. There are three methods available to create a cell on core model. They are called wrappers. There's the cell on core wrapper, the S2I wrapper, which stands for source to image created by Red Hat. And finally, the Docker wrapper, the one I'm going to discuss right now. As for the process, you start by putting your inference logic into a Python class. Next, you specify all the dependencies required to run your model into a requirement text file. Then you create the Docker file, and once that's done, all you have to do is building and pushing your Docker image to the Docker Hub or a private registry. This diagram shows what happens when we send a request, a REST request, to a Selen Core model. The request goes through a reverse proxy, which is Istio, a Selen Core dependency. As a service mesh, Istio is going, to be, is going to place a proxy for every pod deployed on Kubernetes. Then the service orchestr orchestrator redirects the request to one of the pods available, depending on, depending on traffic or latency. Finally, the model server returns the response with the production, something you can see at the bottom of the screen. Remember that DevOps is about monitor monitoring anything possible, and with MLOps, that includes model and data. Why is it important to do that? Mainly because the data distribution might change over time, and models are trained with a certain kind of data. If we train a model with, with data which has a normal distribution, this same model we, is not going to perform well if the new data uh, has a Poisson distribution. Therefore, it is useful to track those changes over time because you will be able to know how to react and adapt to these changes with different types of solutions or combinations. We can do real-time data monitoring thanks to the Fire Orion Context Broker. What we do from the Context Broker is that we push data as soon as it comes to a Docker service which runs the admin algorithm from the scikit-multi-flow Python library. 
It is an adaptive sliding window algorithm for detecting change and keeping updated statistics about a data stream. If you look at the logs on the right, we can get the index every time a change occurred. In this case, the small parking slot status, 0 e free, 1 for occupied. To monitor data drift, which occurs when the input data distribution changes, we use the Python library Evidently AI. That service is going to be placed as a recurring task that will run in Kube. So at a specific time, twice a month, once a month, and as a cron job, we are going to check if the current distribution is different than the baseline distribution by the chi squared test that will calculate the distance between the input variables for the two periods. In this example, no drift detected as the distributions are quite similar. This is, this is how the data drift pipeline looks on Kubeflow. It is an automated task with a cron job that will execute the workflow composed of two components, get data, and evaluate model performance. In case no real drift is, de is detected, we just update some fire attributes, has model drifted, active data drift cron, so that the AI service takes into account those new elements. But if, if the drift is superior than the threshold, we retrain the model using the ML pipeline and we update the fire attributes accordingly and we save the figure into MongoDB. The model drift pipeline is quite similar. It is also an automated task and has two components inside, get data, evaluate model performance with the exact same logic as before. In case of a drift, the model is going to be retra retrained with a DML pipeline, but the only exception here is that we are going to update different fire attributes because we are dealing with the model, not data. Here's a global overview of the three workflow we have set on Kubeflow. There's the main ML, um, there's the main ML pipeline that trains an AI model. The other two are there to monitor the data and the model. And in case of a drift, as I said, the model is retrained either to take, to take into account the new data distribution or that the model performance is fading. For what result, you might ask? Let's check that with the next slide. We evaluated our simple random forest model for a, peer, for a period of six months. We trained that model with two years of historical data. The accuracy of that very first model corresponds to the blue line on the graph. To see how, um, how HEMLOPs can prevent or limit performance drop, we wanted to start with something simple. So we kept the same model for comparison. But for that V2 version, we simply did what is known as a blind update. Every month, we retrain and update the new model to take into account the new data. This is quite important in the, in the IoT field because some sensors only send measure once a month or sometimes when they can, which could be twice a year. What we can see, and as mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, is that the model performance degrades quickly in production, but definitely not at the same rate and at the same speed if we compare the two models. And remember, we are not talking about two different models. It is the same model, but for one, we are just refreshing the training data. Preventing performance drop can give us some extra time to find another solution, such as running a different algorithm or changing or adding input variables into the model. This is something we are going to see in the next section. We cannot keep talking about DevOps or MLOps without mentioning continuous integration, continuous deployment, and continuous training because this is where automation comes into play. Continuous integration. So let's take a very simple example to show how that works under the hood. Let's say that we want to replace our random forest model in favor of AG Boost, and this happens in the train component on Kubeflow. Under the hood, the code change, we launch a GitHub action that will generate a Kubeflow, a Kubeflow experiment pipeline. Next, 
this experiment pipeline will be executed and the result of that run will be copied into the GitHub report. Depending on the result and the condition we set, either the model is added or updated in the model registry, which is where we store all of our models and the production, the production ML pipeline is also updated. Or the code base remains unchanged because the condition isn't met. In that case, the data, scienti the, da the data scientist will go back to the lab and try to find something else to improve the live model. Continuous deployment. Based on the previous example, let's say that our new model XG Boost is better than a random forest using production. The same GitHub action will edit the production ML pipeline Python file in the GitHub repository. And this will trigger another GitHub action that will compile and upload the new ML pipeline on Kubeflow. What you need to understand here is that the ML, um, the ML pipeline file will be compiled to generate an Argo workflow file in the repo. And that is exactly the file we upload on Kubeflow because task execution in, Q in Kubernetes is done by Argo workflow and not in Python. As MLOps is also about continuous training, continuous training, let's see how that works. But the main difference here is that it is an automated task in the production environment, not something that is triggered by a dev. We can use a cron job that runs every month, or it could be triggered in case of a drift. This will create an ML experiment pipeline. The result will be compared with the live model by the fire attributes. If the new model is weaker than the live model, nothing is done. On the other hand, if the new model is better than the live model, then we update the cell and core model in the registry, and we also update the production ML pipeline in Kubeflow. The last section concerns continual experimentation and learning. This happens when everything is all set up in the production environment, as far as pipelines are concerned, and, on, and automation. Then you can try some new stuff to give the customer better value out of the solution. And this is where we are right now, and we are still working on it with the team in Montpellier. The multi-arm bandit strategy. With the multi-arm bandit strategy, we would like to implement a new ML pipeline that will, that will compare several models at the same time, but only the best will be retained and used in production. This is the reason why we called it Highlander for the fun. It works as the actual ML pipeline, but with the only exception that here, we evaluate not just one, but many models at the same time. The shadow model strategy is about running the models side by side. And with an automated task, these two models will be compared. If the shadow model is superior than the live model, we update the live model URL because if, if you remember, a seldom core model is nothing but the server model reachable by REST comments sent to its URL. If the shadow model is weaker than the live model, then we can pick randomly another model available in the registry and set it as the new shadow model. But we could also use this new Highlander pipeline to determine which is going to be the new shadow model. Finally, there's the canary strategy, which is inspired by the canary deployment where part of the traffic is sent to a fraction of the cluster. What you can see on the screen is a YAML file in which I specify how to route the traffic. I can say that I only want 10 person to go to the new model and 90 person goes to, goes to the live model. The idea here is that we are able to evaluate two models from time to time by simply making a query that would, that would sort the two models' performance, and this will be done with Fiverr. This could be useful when a change occurs in the data because we will be able to see which model is less affected by the new data distribution. Continuous learning is not just for ML pipelines or data data analysis. It can also be about tooling. 
with the canary strategy, we, we leverage just one feature of, um, out of uh, KF serving, but really this was only scratching the surface. Let's take the time to talk a bit more about KF serving from Kubeflow. Because as time went by working on this project, we started to wonder what sets KF serving apart from the re rest, from the, uh, I mean, while doing our test. There are many contenders in the MLOps world, such as MLflow, Airflow, ModelDB, Luigi, and Celdon Core. But Cave Serving does have some killer features which are not available yet on the other frameworks. On that graph, you can see that Cave Serving runs on top of Kubernetes. And just like Celdon Core, it uses Istio, the reverse proxy service, as a dependency. But there is another dependency, which is Knative, that helps removing the complexity of auto-scaling, health-checking, and scale to zero. Contrary to Selden Core, GPU auto-scaling is available by default on Kubernetes with KF Serving. It is the result of collaborative work between the open source community, Google, Bloomberg, Selden Core, IBM, and Microsoft. It allows better optimization of cost and better management of resources on the cluster. As for Celdon Core, with KF Serving, you create a model and you wrap it with Docker microservice. Once this is done, what happens when we send a request to the model server? That request goes through an ingress gateway. Next, it goes to the KF Serving controller, which is responsible for creating the service the model server container and log all the requests and responses. Then it is transferred to the Knative service controller, which is in charge of deploying the model server by attaching a queue proxy right next to it to manage, to manage traffic queues and expose metrics. Those metrics are supervised by the Knative part auto scaler KPA on the right on the screen of the screen, which is in charge of monitoring the traffic flow and scaling replicas up or down to adapt to the demand. Finally, the model will make an inference and return the predictions as you can see at the bottom of the graph. Now you know how KF serving works, but what makes it so special? As a picture is worth a thousand words, we will take a very simple example from the Google team itself to show the power of KF serving auto scaling. What you see on the screen is nothing but the Grafana dashboard, which monitors the, mon the number of pods deployed on and the average concurrency on the cluster. When no request is sent to the model server, no pod is deployed on the cluster. But at some point, and for 50 seconds, the service is loaded with 50 requests per second. On the graph, you can see that the system gets an average concurrency of 10. And the auto scaler try, tries scaling up to 10 pots to handle the load. Once the panic conditions are no longer met, we have a stable environment and the auto scaler scales back to zero. And that is awesome. Imagine. We are a company which, which has developed a mobile application that uses, that uses AI in the background. We start with only hundreds of users, but the app is a real success and we get 10x more users. In this scenario, Cave Serving will scale up automatically without having to request the help of a cloud, cloud architect to monitor the application and AI services. On the other hand, and as you may know, decarbonation is a big deal here at Ados, and it can be achieved by using such features. With MLOps, you can evaluate models and data, but it is just as important to evaluate your MLOps maturity. By looking at those three tables, you can see that we started at level zero with no automation at all. Then we reach level one with some kind of automation, but still no CICD, CT. And today we are now at level two, even though it is an internal project with full automation and full monitoring. What you need to understand is that tools like Kubeflow, KF Serving, Salon Core help you reach level two faster 
But what can help you reach level two even faster is applying DevOps principles into your project. You will agree that a tool or a framework is no good if it's not used properly. To be honest, we started this project by looking at each other like, where do we start? What are we going to do? But as soon as we got a better sense of the DevOps culture, everything became easier and smooth. We became enthusiastic, passionate, and this is what DevOps brings to the table. We decided to practice the improvement cater on a daily basis. If you're not familiar with the improvement cater, it is the principle that any ID should be tested. What you need to compare, I mean, you need to compare what you think, the theory, with what actually happens, the evidence, and you adjust or adapt based on the difference you discover. It's a way of thinking that helps you keep improving and reach your goals. Now, when we see each other, it's more like, hey, I have a, I have a new idea that we should try, or I've heard, I heard, I've heard about a new library or framework that we should test. Today, we are even talking about data simulators to train our models with all kinds of data distributions, so that when unseen data go through the data flow, the system will not hit the panic button because it will know what to do precisely to maintain a good overall performance. So to conclude, for us, DevOps is not just a word you put in a document or a slide. It is culture, something we believe in, something we do every day, and something we apply from end to end inside a project. We hope that this presentation will make you realize that MLOps is a game changer for any project because it already facilitates the adoption of AI for many companies. Goodbye.